Okay, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I welcome you to this new conference of the Webster Geneva Global Dialogue Series. Uh, my name is Lionel Faton. I'm an assistant professor of international relations at Webster University Geneva and the manager of the WGGD. I'm pleased and honored to welcome today Audrey Tang to discuss digital democracy. Uh, Minister Tang, thank you so much for being with us. It's a, it's a real pleasure to have you here. It's a good local time, everyone. Really happy to be here. Thank you so much. So for the few of you who do not know Audrey Tang, let me just introduce her. Um, Audrey Tang is, the, is Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation. She is known for revitalizing the computer languages Perl and Askill, as well as, as well as building the online spreadsheet system EtherCalc in collaboration with Dan, Dan Bricklin. In the public sector, Minister Tang served on Taiwan National Development Council Open Data Committee and the 12-year Basic Education Curriculum Committee and led the country's first e-rulemaking project. In the private sector, Minister Tang worked as a consultant with Apple on computational linguistics, with Oxford University Press on crowd lexicography, and with social text on social interaction design. In the social sector, Minister Tang actively contributes to GovZero, a community focusing on creating tools for the civil society with the call to fork the government. Now, this leads me to introduce today's topic, namely digital democracy. So democracy is based on the active participation of the people in public affairs. Now, due to the complexity of human society and the impossibility of making each and every citizen a politician, democratic regimes have developed systems of representation, such as parliaments and voting processes that connect people and the polity and allow the former to have a say in the management of the community. However, these systems of representation are not flawless and have engendered a democratic fatigue in many countries where citizens have lost interest in politics and have disengaged from democratic practices. Some two centuries ago, Alexis de Tocqueville asserted that one of the biggest dangers of democracies was just that, political disengagement by the citizens. The rapid digitalization of societies accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic offer, offers opportunities for rethinking democratic governance and strengthening participatory politics. It may also ease consensus, consensus building, thereby reducing the risk of a tyranny of the majority. On the other hand, digitalization poses risk to democracies, from disinformation campaigns to social polarization and populist tendencies. Given her, given her expertise and responsibilities, Minister Tang is the ideal interlocutor to work us through this highly complex topic. Now, before giving the floor to Minister Tang, let me tell you a bit about the logistics of this conference. So, Prime Minister Tang, uh, Minister Tang, sorry, not yet Prime Minister. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll give a speech for about 20 minutes and then we will open the floor for a Q&A session and the entire exercise will last about one hour. Um, during the Q&A session, please, if you have questions, raise your hand in um, with the raise your hand option and my wonderful assistant will uh, unmute you uh, so that you can ask the question. Um, overall, please keep your microphone muted during uh, Minister Tang's presentation. And of course, the Q&A session, except if you provided the floor. Now, uh, without a further ado, let's hear from Minister Tang about Taiwan experience in and any initiatives related to digital democracy. Uh, Minister Tang, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, really happy to be here. Uh, and um, unlike many people uh, working on digital and democracy, I'm an optimist in combining the two. Uh, and this strange condition began when I was 15 years old. That was 1996. I discovered that the future of human knowledge is on the wild web and my textbooks were all out of date. So I told my teachers I want to quit school and start my education on the wild web. Surprisingly, my teachers all agreed with it. 
a year later, I founded a startup working on web technologies, and I got to join this fabulous internet community that runs with this crazy idea, an open and grassroots political system that powers the internet to this day. And today, as Taiwan's first digital minister, I'm putting into practice the ideas that I learned when I was 15 years old. And that was rough consensus, civic participation and radical transparency. And surprisingly, it's working very well. It's transforming our society. In 2016, our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, said an inspiring statement in her inauguration speech. She said, before democracy was a clash between two opposing values, but now democracy must become a conversation between many diverse values. So instead of being the arbiter torn between different sides, our government now asks a very different set of questions. We would ask, what are our co-creation, our common values, despite different positions? And then we ask, given the common values, can we make civic technologies, solutions that work for everyone and with everyone? And so the branch of technology, civic technology, enable millions of people to listen to each other instead of just one person speak to millions of people. In the past couple of years, Taiwan has been consistently ranked among the best in the world in both pandemic resilience and economic growth. And this was because since 2014, we adopted digital democracy as our national direction, catalyzed, as you see here, by a Occupy movement in March 2014. There was a demo, a live demo of mass participation. We occupied the parliament peacefully, very uh, important to note, peacefully for 22 days. At the time, the MPs in Taiwan were refusing to deliberate substantially a trade service agreement with Beijing. So we got into the parliament at night and stayed there. For three weeks, we demonstrated, not as a protest, but as a demo, we demoed how to deliberate such a trade agreement with the whole society. There were over 20 NGOs participating, the Greens, Labors, Independents, everybody. And we, the G0, Week of Zero uh, movement, supported this deliberation process with a radically transparent broadcasting, live streaming, cable, power, radio, logistics system. And G0V, as I mentioned, is a civic tech community. The call, as you've already heard, is to fork the government. Uh, fork means in software engineering to take something that's already there, not writing it off. So we take the government websites, which all end in GOV.TW and make better open alternatives that ends in something that G0V.TW. For example, in 2012, in the very beginning, the annual national budget was hundreds of pages long in a PDF file, very hard to read. So GovZero's very first project was budget.g0v.tw, which showed the national budget in the same way, but everyone understands now because you can drill down interactively to each and every detail. Today, the system after being forked is now merged by many city government and also the national participation platform join the gov.tw. So anyone can just look at a map, find a part of budget they care about and type in any question they want to ask. And a career public servant actually comes forward and answer that part of the question. So it became a direct dialogue platform, not necessarily through the MPs or city councillors, but for the career public servants to communicate directly with citizens. So why are there so many civic tech people in Taiwan like me? I spoke to my clients during the Sunflower Movement, Apple, Oxford, uh, University Press and Social Techs. And I said, OK, I have to take a three week leave because democracy needs me. Uh, and I think that's because our generation, uh, I'm 40 now, we're the first generation that enjoyed freedom of speech after three decades of martial law and dictatorship. So that freedom arrived in 1989, the year of personal computers. So for us, the personal computer revolution and the freedom of speech is not two things. It's the one and same thing. Our first presidential election by popular vote in 1996 was also the year that the wild web got really popular. So for the past 30 years, when we see free software, we always think of freedom of assembly of speech and never free of cost because we know that freedom is never free of costs. Our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation paid dearly for it and we needed to use the software freedom to keep it free as we did during the Sunflower Movement in 2014. Now, the movement caused a peaceful revolution. 
there was a radical transformation of social expectations of the end of the 2014. There was a mayoral election and all the mayors that did not support open government simply did not get elected. Uh, and the elected mayors sometimes uh, did so surprisingly without preparing an inauguration speech. So the occupiers and the civic tech people who supported them, we were then invited as reverse mentors, young people who mentor the cabinet. Uh, to advise the public service to solve emerging issues such as Uber. Now, Uber is very interesting because in 2015, it started as a meme, a virus of the mind, right? Called a sharing economy, which said that code dispatch cars better than laws, so we don't have to obey laws, but just code or something like that. Uh, so the meme spread through apps from drivers to passengers to driver, and you can't really argue with a meme, right? You can't argue with the common flu. It's not in the same category. Uh, so there's protests. The taxi drivers surrounded the Ministry of Transportation. We see it around the world demanding negotiation. But how do we negotiate with a meme? Uh, for us, the solution is not uh, through talking with the meme. It's through out memeing them, uh, through the deliberation that involves thousands of stakeholders to create common new memes. Uh, and it's a scaling down of the millions of people on the street we just did. So we, we think we can do it. Now, to think deeply about something together or deliberation is an effective vaccine against the virus of the mind. When all the passengers, drivers, academics, public servants listen to one another and form a rough, good enough consensus, we become immune to divisive PR campaigns and conspiracy theories. So we adopted the focus conversation method uh, involving four stages. The first one is facts, where we collect evidence, first-hand experience, objective data, open data, and publish it to everyone. And after that is confirmed, we move to collect everyone's feelings about those same facts. So you may feel upset, uh, I may feel happy, uh, it's all okay. And after people converge on their feelings for around three weeks, that resonates with everybody, we then talk about ideas. The best ideas are the ones that address the most people's feelings. And then we simply translate those crowdsource agenda and ideas into legalese and sign them into decisions. Now, prior to the digital um, web, the decision-making process was not very transparent, and people on the street would speak a very different language than people in the government. So they are not even agreeing on basic facts, uh, let alone each other's feelings. So POLIS, the system that you see here, is a way to make sure that we have a pro-social social media instead of an anti-social corner of social media where uh, the ideas become ideologies, polarization that blinds people to each one's views, uh, we make sure that you see your uh, friends and families on those clusters. Uh, and this interactive survey is crowdsourced, meaning that even the ministries do not have a, a, an idea of what are the people's feelings. So we simply ask people, how do you feel? And four groups of people soon emerge, the taxi drivers, Uber drivers, Uber passengers, and other passengers. And the system then show each group how their shared sentiments are received by other groups. And the interesting thing is, simply by clicking agree to move toward me or disagree to move forward uh, away from me, it, it lowers people's antagonism. <laughs> because you can see that people on all those clusters are your friends and families. You just didn't talk about sharing economy or gig economy over dinner, right? So at the beginning, people were on all the corners. But because we say we only give binding agenda setting power to anything that uh, people can propose that convince all the clusters. So the participant converge on feelings that resonate not just with like-minded people, not just in the filter bubble, but across the aisle. So instead of distracting, we attracted consensus. And after we got a set of feelings that resonates with practically everybody, it's now much easier for the government to meet with all the stakeholders and check with them one by one. So we would say, here is the consensus of the people on this pro-social social media. And as the taxi union, as Uber, do you agree? Uh, if you do agree, how do we translate that into law? So they're bound to the words that they said during the live stream consultation. And all the stakeholders did agree. So um, Uber have been for quite a few years now a legal taxi company, uh, the Q-Taxi. Uh, when we ratified the agreement in August 2016, just one year after this consultation, everybody anticipated it. So it's a win-win solution because the local temples, co-ops, and so on can enjoy the same access to the laws uh, that allows for dynamic dispatch, surge pricing, and so on, uh, with the common understanding that insurance registration not undercutting existing meters are important. 
So our next question, 2016, is can we scale this up? So in 2016, I joined the cabinet as digital minister uh, and to explore this possibility of scaling this, not just on nationwide emerging tech issues, but on everything through the public digital innovation space. We work with designers, programmers, facilitators. We focus on being assistive, automating away the chores that the facilitators were doing in order to make more room for participation. So it's not just technological contribution, it's the culture that we're bringing to the government. For example, I'm a radically transparent digital minister. And by that, I mean all the journalists, all the lobbyists. I think this is David Plouffe lobbying for Uber. Everybody get to ask me questions, but only publicly. Uh, and it's not just for them, but also for internal cross-ministerial meetings. For all the hundreds of meetings I have chaired since I became digital minister, everything was transcribed and tracked on track.pds.tw. There was a written record or video record for everything everybody said during those meetings, and we send them to participants afterward to check for 10 working days, and then we just publish, relinquish all the copyrights. And the effect of this is very surprising because the public servants became very innovative and even risk taking. They proposed some very good ideas under this condition. And that's because previously, before radical transparency, the public service gets the blame if things go wrong and the minister always gets the credit if things go right. But with this record, it flips it around. If things go right, the public servant get a credit because their name is on the transcript. Uh, but because this is voluntary, this is experimental method, if things go wrong, it's always Audrey's fault. And under this condition, they became super innovative and open to a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, one of the ideas is adopting this co-creation platform straight from the free software community called Sandstorm as our public service infrastructure. We host the community tools like Git, HackND, Rocket Chat, precisely how the free software open source community is organizing on the open internet these days. We have a lot of interesting system uh, actually written by young public servants, like apps for ordering lunch together or planned travels together and so on. And so it's really good to have this choice uh, to amplify this innovation innovation instead of uh, having to subscribe uh, to the system integrators or large uh, private sector vendors. This enable a free software culture within the public service. And in this spirit, we co-create a petition platform as a way for people to participate. It's like a We the People platform in the US. Uh, but the US system, as I understood it, um, it's offline now, but when it was online, it did not receive the same level of attention as in Taiwan, perhaps because for cross-ministerial issues, people would just get bureaucratic answers that explains the issue rather than resolving the issue. So uh, we ask all 32 ministries in the national cabinet to build a team of participation officers or POs. So when people start a petition and collect 5,000 signatures, they know instead of just a dutiful response, they will actually get to meet with all the relevant ministries, either in Taipei, our capital city, or we travel to the rural areas and islands if they are petitioning for local development. And twice a month, we would meet to resolve those issues together without exposing any public servant to risk. So uh, after more than 100 collaborative meetings, which are all tracked here, we relieved uh, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. For example, a petitioner in 2017 rallied um, the Mac and Linux user saying the text filing experience was, and I quote, explosively hostile to use. And instead of explaining the problem, uh, we invited everyone who complained the loudest to just co-create a text filing system. And through this kind of co-creation, people learn they can contribute their expertise, not just as complaints, but as contributors. And by collaborating with the social sector, we're building a robust environment suitable for social innovators. Uh, where the power of civil society can be brought into full play. And you're looking at a social innovation lab, my office. I personally provide my office hour at the lab every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Well, before the pandemic, nowadays also uh, through the telecommunication, uh, provided that my visitor uh, agreed to have our conversation posted online, radically transparent. Anyone interested in social entrepreneurship is welcome to have a discussion with me. So the different regional city social innovators gather around me when I tour around Taiwan. I still tour around Taiwan because we've never had a lockdown. Uh, although it's just me that travel, everybody else remain uh, through a physical distance very safely uh, in Taipei or other municipalities. Uh, but we provide a video conference and transcription service that make it very easy to see the local patterns surfaced and resolved in a very quick fashion and through the related ministries, through their uh, participation office and network to scale 
scale it uh, and so that the ministries in other uh, departments said, OK, so the way we solve the tax filing system can also be used in our business, like distribute mask or book vaccines and so on. A recent example is coming up with an effective solution to contact tracing. To eliminate community transmission, contact tracing must be done in a way that makes sure we don't put ourselves into a dilemma of having to choose between protecting privacy on one hand and preventing a public health crisis on the other hand. So we see other jurisdictions rolling out mandatory government apps and we see them backfire. Um, so instead of centralizing contact tracing data, data uh, to the one size fits all government uh, site or yielding control to multinational corporations. We do neither. We sought social sector, social entrepreneurship solutions working with the people. Uh, in May 2021, Civic Tech in the G0 Week of Zero community invented this contact tracing method based on text messages. We work across sectors with telecom carriers to deploy this in just a week. By scanning the QR code with whatever camera scanner you have on your phone, the building camera, sending a toll free text message, people can keep track of their itineraries. This allow contact tracers to confirm the footprints of infected people and their contacts without revealing any private information to venue owners. And well, uh, in the past two years and counting, Taiwan only had less than 1,000 casualty uh, because we reduced uh, contact tracing from over 24 hours to less than 24 minutes. Uh, of course, we need to peacefully coexist with people who don't use smartphones. So handwriting and stamping is still allowed. Paper-based is still allowed. And when contact tracers apply for information about those numbers, they submit the request through the platform you see here. And the phone number holder can then reverse audit the contact tracers requests and activities. All records are, of course, deleted after 28 days. And because the civic tech originated from GovZero, who always valued data sovereignty, uh, we respond to new challenges with timely improvements. For exa example, Text messages sent to 1922 were discovered by a judge assessing a police search warrant a few months after the introduction. Fortunately, by encrypting the multi-party design, it prevented the police from making sense of the 15 random digits. So the judge denied the search warrant of the mapping database and publicly questioned the legality of even sending those texts to police officers in the first place. And the Ministry of Justice immediately concluded publicly that the SMS does not constitute the Surveillance Act communication and therefore should never be repurposed for law enforcement, keeping the original civic intent intact. So rule by the people is the original intent of democracy. In the face of global threats such as pandemic and infodemic, I believe the Taiwan model shows the world that this people-public-private partnership with the people, not just for the people, can shape a digital democracy. So to conclude, uh, to give no trust is to get no trust. Trusting citizens to participate in policy making can form shared goals, can develop innovative solutions, and also can contribute to the world. Thank you for listening and I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Minister Tang, for this brilliant conversation. Um, I, I, I have thousands of questions, but I, I know people are waiting, so I, I will limit myself to a few of them. Um, so I, I was wondering first, uh, when, when, when you talked about these three steps, uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to the rough consensus about facts, feelings, mm -hmm. ideas, Mm -hmm. um, what what, are, what about if you, you you don't have a convergence of feeling? Is the is is this is, is this um, a, a possibility that you have uh, actually think thought about that actually you may find uh, an issue that is so polarizing that a conver convergence of feeling is basically out out of the equation? Great question. Uh, so through the application of the idea of overlapping consensus, we always refine the uh, consultation topic to be as specific as possible. For example, if the question was, what's the future of platform economy? Is it sharing or gig economy? Uh, the feelings may not converge, uh, but the proposal was actually, um, how do you feel about someone driving to work and back, picking up random strangers they meet through an app and charging them for it without professional driver's license? Uh, 
So, uh, so the specific proposal makes it possible for people to resonate with a specific scenario. And regardless of their ideologies, they can then share their authentic feelings. So whenever we detect something that is too overly abstract, like uh, marriage equality, uh, we always whit it down uh, to very specific uh, proposals. For example, uh, how about uh, people who are single mothers or not in a heterosexual uh, relationship uh, who raise uh, their children and make sure their children uh, is feeling welcome uh, by the society and that in uh, instead of marriage equality tend to get people into a talkative and sharing pro-social mood i see so for 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 those for my students who are attending because we, i have a, i have a course on the theory of political uh, uh, an introduction to political theory we will, we will discuss what you mentioned mr tong um uh, overlapping consensus so john, john rawls and etc so for those online please please follow. Uh, also raise your hand if you want to ask questions and uh, we will uh, unmute, unmute you. And I, have a, I, have a, I would have another question. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you're part of the government, you're, you're minister. Uh, when when you, you enter the government, well you approach first the government with this idea of you know increasing transparency, uh, gaining trust by providing trust and etc. I mean have you not faced resistance by civil servants or your colleagues in the cabinet saying, well, listen, uh, this is not how we do and uh, we prefer a certain lack of transparency on, in regarding certain of our activities or you were, you were welcomed mm -hmm. uh, with your new ideas? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, we, we are the resistance, by the way. Uh, so uh, we are the occupiers, remember. Uh, and, and the implicit threat uh, is that if the government uh, is not willing to increase the bandwidth of democracy or reduce the latency of democracy, the people will always prefer direct action. Now, that's uh, not always said, but it's always implied. Uh, and so because of this outside game, so to speak, uh, the various mayors uh, and politicians political parties in our parliament, uh, there's four major parties now, all of them compete on being more open. Uh, all of them sign on the open parliament agenda, simply because they know if they don't, they don't get elected, period. Uh, and so I think this is a norm first uh, approach. When people see during the pandemic, um, that pretty much all the good counter-pandemic ideas are from the social sector. Uh, and the government simply through daily 2 p.m. press conferences amplify those good ideas from the municipalities and townships and so on. People then learn uh, that it is everyone's duty uh, to, com uh, to um, comprehend, uh, so to speak, uh, the latest uh, virus variants and innovate uh, on it. And this is um, only possible, I believe, because we in the cabinet uh, are very fortunate in operate in a uh, transpartisan or nonpartisan um, neutral uh, space. Uh, in Taiwan constitutional uh, design, uh, the people elect directly the president, who appoint the premier, who appoint the ministers. So there's um, nine ministers at large, including me, and I think seven are nonpartisan. Uh, and all the mayor, um, the, sorry, the mayoral candidates in 2014, they are all of the different parties, but they all support this kind of radical transparency idea. And uh, currently in the cabinet, there's more independents uh, than members of any party. I, I can go on. Uh, and so because uh, our constitutional design made uh, the Korea Public Service align with the nonpartisan or transpartisan uh, ministers, uh, this uh, voice to be become a this party versus other party, left versus right thing uh, and become just a is the fundamental infrastructure that we see democracy just like semiconductor design <laughs> that you can always improve on and it takes all the citizens to improve upon it. I, I, I see then, then it, it leads me to a follow up because you, you mentioned about we the people in the United States, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, I don't know how you, whether you consider it as a failure or but it seems that it didn't work as well as uh, what you're doing in Taiwan. Uh, well, in the United States, you, you know better than I do, uh, this is a bipartisan system in which you have a polar, polarization of the state apparatus that is, that is pretty acute. Um, then the question beyond the United States, even uh, whether, whether the, the Taiwanese experience and new initiatives is something that is applicable for to other countries. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking also not only about countries where there is a, a political polarization, but also in countries where people are not technologically savvy as the younger generation in Taiwan. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's two questions. Uh, both of them very good. Uh, the, the first question about polarization, uh, the assistive intelligence polis that I just showed um, is actually from Seattle. Uh, and uh, uh, there's this foundation called Computational Democracy. And it's adopted by not just Europe and Taiwan, but also in the US uh, as well. Uh, and uh, this is an actual conversation from Bowling Green, uh, Kentucky. Um, if you search for a Bowling Green polis, uh, Civic Assembly, I believe, uh, you will see the entire report. Uh, and the shape is consistent. So just because it's in the US uh, doesn't mean that people don't agree <laughs> with most of their neighbors' points on most of the things most of the time. Uh, they agree to disagree on a few divisive ideologies, but because in this pro-social space, uh, people compete to get the agenda communicated across the aisle because that's a scoreboard. Uh, so you see people saying that arts uh, are important in STEM education. We need to make it STEAM, uh, broadband diversification of suppliers and things like that. And, and so uh, you can see that this combines very well uh, with a locality or municipal or even uh, state level uh, consultations, even in a uh, what's perceived as a polarized political environment uh, compared to some more antisocial corners of social media, um, namely Facebook, uh, which I often like to uh, the digital equivalent of a nightclub where people have to shout to get heard, addictive drinks, smoke filled room, private bouncers, uh, and I can go on. Uh, so, so by by building in Bowling Green, Kentucky, the digital equivalent of a campus, of a town hall, uh, you can, a uh, public park or whatever, uh, you can avoid the, the direct consequence of having to do your town hall consultations in your local nightclub. And now the second question about digital savings. We, we bring technology to the people. We're, we're not asking people to come to technology. So while you see uh, the social innovation lab tools and so on, for the local people, it's just their, uh, their same uh, conversation that already happened in their community is just that through digital communities, we connect them uh, with people who they barely know in some other cities, in some other municipality that share uh, the same social issues and we connect them to the participation offices in all the ministries. But after all, we're not asking them to go to any website. We're coming to them through the tours. Thank, thank you so much. Just before I, I open the floor to uh, for questions, I, I, I love your comparison between Facebook and the nightclub. I will keep it in mind. Thank you so much for that. Uh, now, um, can we can we unmute uh, Joe Marquez, please? Their, their mics are enabled, but they have to unmute. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. So, um, Joseph. I've given him the ability to unmute, but I can't. Joseph, can you unmute yourself? doesn't seem to be the case. So next one, um, uh, Madam Watanabe, can you unmute, unmute yourself? Yes, um, hello. Uh, my name is Anna from Japan and I am really a big fan of you, Audrey, and uh, I really love your idea of a demo, uh, digital democracy and that you are working with the people, not for the people. Um, I would like to know um, how are you keeping yourself so innovative? Um, like um, sometimes you might be um, like becoming too busy of daily works and you're maybe becoming too tired. How do you make yourself uh, time to think like uh, um, always keep being innovative? Uh, do you meet people or do you read big books? If so, can you recommend some good books, for example? Uh, I, I always uh, recommend uh, the Tao Te Ching. It's a very old book uh, by Lao Tzu. It's a Taoist scripture. Uh, and I recommend the Ursula K. Le Guin translation uh, that I always use. Um, and the, the Tao Te Ching, uh, really doesn't prescribe anything, uh, but rather it frees one's mind uh, against uh, overdoing anything. Uh, it reminds everyone to be just good enough, uh, not perfect. 
uh, because if you are perfect, there is no room for innovations to enter. Uh, but if you're just good enough uh, and ask the communities to correct uh, your bias, to correct uh, the shortcomings, then you make very good friends, right? Uh, and personally speaking, uh, I always uh, read uh, books and so on, uh, materials before I go to sleep, but I do not make judgments in my mind. I just scan them into my visual cortex and I don't even speak uh, out loud in my mind. I just very quickly scan through them and then I, I go to sleep. I trust uh, my dreams uh, so that when I wake up, I always get some holistic ideas uh, that are innovative and creates common values out of very different positions. So I don't give myself pressure uh, during daytime or during nighttime. I make sure that I uh, work, uh, so to speak, uh, in my sleep. And if there is really a lot of tension, a lot of conflict, like the stakeholders are all over the place, um, I take all the sides, meaning that that if there's a certain stakeholder's uh, voice that I simply cannot comprehend, I always think it's my problem, not their problem. And I spend extra time traveling with them, living with them if necessary, uh, doing um, the ethnographic, uh, just hanging out uh, with them and making sure that uh, I understand where they're coming from. And then uh, if I have to uh, comprehend many sides, I just uh, work extra hours, sleep for nine hours, or sleep for 10 hours, uh, until I naturally wake up uh, with a synthetic, more holistic picture. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And you, and you, mm -hmm. Any follow up, uh, Watanabe-san? It's OK? Yeah, yeah uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to know that you also sleep uh, long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean too, I'm pretty jealous, actually. But I will try to convince my boss that it is uh, something it's work. easy. Yeah, it works. So I, I, I will convince him. I will send him this, this video. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Yiska, can you unmute yourself? Abdulaziz, can you unmute yourself? Um, okay, yeah, finally I can. Um, Thank you. Please go on. Um, first of all, this was very, very thought provoking, a lot of food for thought. Uh, it was very interesting um, how democracy and digitalization and technology all go hand in hand. And God, I have a lot of questions. But first of all, I would like to thank you and the organizers because this was a this has been a very, very um, wonderful opportunity for us uh, for people, students like us to learn. Um, so very simple questions. You mentioned that uh, so in your presentation, the public volunteers are happy if things go right. If not, it's Audrey's fault. And this leads them to become innovative and um, risk taking, right? So while that may be true in some cases, um, I'm not trying to be pessimistic. I'm a very optimistic person, but uh, I have a question that whether because if there's always a scapegoat, then isn't that a bit detrimental on the, let's say, societal or psychological level? Just a question. Thank you. Um, so to clarify what, what I heard, what I'm hearing is that you're, you're asking uh, if people can simply say oh, blame Audrey. Uh, would that not create a kind of dependency uh, on, on, on my position or on my kind of uh, Taoist um, uh, bearings? Uh, and wouldn't it be better uh, if it's uh, simply institutionalized? Um, I think this is a really good question and something I think about a lot in the past five and more years uh, when I became the digital, after I became the digital minister. So we try very hard to design ourselves out uh, and institutionalize uh, the kind of uh, scaling up of the local innovations. Uh, so for example, uh, you're, you're looking at presidential hackathon and this is our attempt as institutionalizing me. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have a regulation uh, now that says uh, every year, uh, if you're a Taiwanese citizen, you can be in the public or social private sector, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can uh, make a wish uh, on any of the SDG global goal topics. Uh, and um, 
the civic hackers uh, who want to improve upon those uh, can propose things that uh, would work on a local level. Uh, and uh, people would vote uh, using a new voting method called quadratic voting uh, that assigns the same marginal cost to the same marginal uh, effect. Um, don't have time to go into details. Uh, so with 99 uh, points per person, everyone can vote across the 200 or more uh, projects every year in a way that uh, uncovers their synergies. Uh, and then we mentor the top 20 or so uh, for around three months before they get those trophies, five teams get those trophies from our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. And uh, when you turn on the micro projector that you see is the bottom of this trophy, it projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen handing you the trophy uh, and uh, promising whatever you did locally will become national policy with all the personnel budget and regulation support in the next fiscal year. And we've been doing this for, for five years now. Um, so I think this is a way to, uh, there's still a, a abstract president in this case, not Minister Tang, uh, but it's uh, embedded in this micro projector. Uh, it's embedded into the culture uh, that people understand that uh, the social innovators can focus on their innovations and the state is willing to merge whatever fork, uh, pre-commit to merge five forks per year uh, that convinces a, a majority of people through quadratic voting. Uh, I, I can go on, there's many other institutional designs, but uh, just uh, it's not about pessimism is about being real uh, and we tried very hard and sometimes successfully uh, to design myself out into institutions. Thank you. Abdulaziz, you will have an optimistic follow-up. Try to be optimistic sometimes, Abdulaziz, please. Uh, well, I have a rather simplistic question, which is, a uh, can I can I ask it? I, well, it's, it's, it's more on a, glo a global scale. Because so far the presentation and all this have been tried uh, uh, focused on very domestic um, proceedings. Uh, I have a more uh, international based, uh, global based uh, question. You mentioned the US quite a few times. So for example, I'm from Pakistan and uh, mm -hmm. if we were to um, evolve this much in technology, I wouldn't find it a surprise. For example, let's say tomorrow India, there is some um, some cyber attacks or let's say some some interventions from India because it's well it's global uh, international politics um, and so in case of Taiwan for example when you have a nearby um, country which has let's say quantum computers or uh, alleged quantum computers um, how, how do you how do you make sure that there is no foreign intervention uh, let's say, for example, Chinese intervention uh, in in Taiwanese cyberspace. Whenever you're doing the voting and everything, just a very simple mm -hmm. question because I'm mm -hmm. I'm yeah. very interested. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, Thank you. Really good question. Yeah, the, the Sandstorm uh, product that I showed, uh, Polis also, uh, we invite the white hat hackers uh, to attack on that. So uh, if you are a cybersecurity professional in Taiwan, uh, you, you, you're, you're going to be um, have a lot of fame and fortune uh, simply because you know cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, the white hat hackers do the penetration testing in Sivan, uh, not because they, they love their country, although I'm sure Sure, many of them do, uh, but because it, it really pays very well uh, and, uh, and you get to meet with the president and minister uh, all the time uh, and uh, we only deploy uh, to the public service after they're thoroughly penetration tested uh, by those red team uh, experts. And if you look at uh, DEF CON CTF and so on, uh, the Taiwanese teams are consistently like in the second place or something uh, next only to the US team most of the time. So uh, we, we take the cybersecurity issue very seriously. And and we also ensure uh, that uh, the public infrastructure, we use the open source components uh, through this um, auditing, uh, community auditing. So we share the auditing and penetration testing resources uh, with uh, other jurisdictions who use the same components as we are using. Uh, and so I believe with many eyes, the, the bugs are more shallow uh, and we also uh, value resilience uh, a lot. So in case uh, that any of our data centers goes offline and so on, there's always multiple backup plans and not necessarily for interventions, right? Uh, because we're in a place with a lot of earthquakes and typhoons is also by necessity uh, due to those natural disasters. And it also gives us plenty of time to run drills. I uh, hope that answers your question. 
Thank you very much. That was lovely input. Thank you very much for the mm -hmm. thought provoking enlightenment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Yiska, you should be able to un unmute yourself now, please. Yes, I managed to do that. Thank you very much. Um, yes, good morning. I had one question about the, the expression of feelings period in a decision making mm -hmm. process. Um, quite frankly, you know, I've been recently traumatized by the way people just shout out at Twitter. So I was wondering the way you present it, uh, it doesn't strike me that that happens in this process. And if it mm -hmm. does not happen, how do you explain that in this process mm -hmm. that you have designed, that part does not mm -hmm. happen? which mm -hmm. is quite destructive in, in many ways mm -hmm. and, and yeah. polarizes people rather mm -hmm. than converges people. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, this interface has the remarkable feature uh, of no reply buttons. So, and, and that applies to all our spaces, uh, not just Polis, uh, but join platform, the e-petition. Uh, we learned from Better Reykjavik uh, in Iceland. So you have a column of upvotable supporting arguments. You have another column of alternate uh, options that are also upvotable, but there is no reply button. You can't really shout at, it, at each other, uh, you know, across the aisle. Uh, the Slido, the Polis join and so on, they all follow the same design pattern of no reply buttons. And we discover that uh, with reply buttons, trolls grow and with no reply buttons trolls can't waste other people's times is as simple as that that is genius no reply buttons i love that thank you <laughs> thank you um elena can you unmute yourself and ask your question to be or let's let's turn to fatma You should have the floor, Fatma. Otherwise, write down in the chat, and I will, uh, and I will read your question. Uh, now, uh, so in the meantime, just a question, Minister Tan. Um, since you you began implementing all these initiatives, um, have you seen talking to people? Uh, have you seen them more engaged in political issues? Have you seen the, I would say, a democratic flavor, um, you know, growing in Taiwan? Is there a real effect on the on the way people think about their government, about their role in in the community? Yes, and it's uh, the most pronounced uh, in the basic education age bracket, people under eighteen. Uh, and the reason why is that they're before the voting age, right? So prior to these uh, designs, there's simply no way for them to participate in representative politics. Uh, but now uh, people under 18 are uh, the first class citizens uh, in our open government uh, plan. Uh, and in fact, uh, we do have, uh, I think this is primary schoolers uh, contributing to the air pollution measurement uh, in around Taiwan, uh, just in their balconies or in their primary schools, uh, they have this um, Raspberry Pi or Arduino uh, based open hardware, open software uh, air boxes uh, that measures the air quality and contribute to distributed ledgers. And they learn data stewardship uh, and feel a sense of empowerment because whether their parents go outside to uh, jog to run uh, in the morning depends on their uh, numerical contributions uh, in their school and in their balconies because the uh, official uh, weather stations are just uh, very far away, right? So uh, by taking matters to their own hands in primary school level and in middle school level, then they would fact check the three presidential candidates around 2020 uh, as they are having the platform and debate uh, and they contribute to the crowdsource fact checking. So if they uh, they type down all the transcript, the presidential candidates were saying and fact check uh, against uh, the known sources and after vetted by professional journalists, their contribution can appear in the national live stream uh, for fact checking the presidential candidates. Again, that's very empowering. And uh, once they're on the senior high, uh, I think the uh, joint platforms petitions, uh, one of the most active edge brackets are uh, senior high students around um, 16, 17 years old. Uh, and the next uh, most active are 60, 70. <laughs> and I think uh, these two age brackets have more time on their hands, uh, frankly, and they care more about sustainability, about future generations. 
generations. And so, for example, we have a 16 year old uh, girl uh, proposing that we ban plastic straws out of the takeouts of our national drink bubble tea, among others. Uh, and we held collaborative meetings and there's a lot of 60 and 70 years of supporting her. Um, but without, you know, going on strike every Friday, uh, we eventually implemented the, the conversations uh, rough consensus and uh, she is now uh, she's just ni uh, 19 now. She's now the uh, counselor, the committee member of our national action plan on open government. So um, Commissioner uh, Wang uh, is her name. And so just by, you know, giving the young people the titles, commissioner, reverse mentors, national advisors, uh, it makes sure that they feel fully empowered even before they turn 18. Uh, otherwise, they won't start uh, magically caring when they turn 18. Incredible. I wish my daughter had this, the, the, the chance to participate in politics and, uh, and get engaged before, before 18. Um, I, I have um, the, the, the head of the Department of International Relations at Webster University, Ginella, Jubin Gudarzi, who wants to ask a question. So, of course, he has the priority. Jubin? Uh, good morning. Yes, no, I, I don't want to cut in front of anybody else who, who may have a question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister Tang. I enjoyed your presentation very much, very illuminating, very enriching. Um, my question is, um, well, Taiwan, of course, is a country which is a, uh, uh, it's, a it, it's a developed country. Uh, it's come a long way uh, since uh, over the past, since the 1950s, 60s in terms of development. And of course, um, it's a democracy. It's it, it made the transformation success such a democracy. Um, in the 1980s, and uh, and you have a population of over 20 million, around 23, 24 million. Um, in terms of the the model that you've implemented, and with the policies that you're pursuing in Taiwan, and of course you have other countries in the world. Of course, there are countries whose population is smaller, less than Taiwan, and there are many others whose population is lot greater than Taiwan and de developing and developed. I was wondering. Uh, I know you, your, your, your focus, of course, your responsibilities are due um, are with regard to your own country, Taiwan. But I was wondering whether with regard to the model and policies that you've adopted in Taiwan, what do you see the challenges and uh, and also maybe the benefits of trying to implement a similar approach in other countries which have, may have smaller populations or larger populations and, and be at, dif at different stages of development? I know it's a very sweeping question. But if you have just maybe one or two insights you could share with us, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, full disclosure, I'm not just digital minister at TW, I'm also on the board of seven uh, social innovation organizations, uh, NGOs around the world uh, working on their jurisdictions. So uh, Taiwan is just one tentacle, <laughs> so to speak, uh, one lab uh, upon which that, that we can uh, experiment. And indeed, as I mentioned, uh, I, we learned the uh, no reply button thing from Reykjavik, uh, from Iceland, uh, which is um, another example that was often cited in textbooks. Uh, we learned participatory budgeting uh, from the Council Democracy Foundation and later on Decidima uh, in Spain and in Barcelona, respectively. And there are also uh, textbook examples. Uh, and we learned uh, about um, the open data to open API uh, data collaboratives uh, from GovLab. I'm also a international advisor there in New York. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the Seattle people uh, invented Polis and uh, also people in New Zealand and uh, work on many uh, presidential hackathon-like projects. And we have uh, ENSTEC, right? Taiwan-New Zealand relationship bilateral uh, that allow our presidential hackathon champions to also work in their jurisdictions and so on. So um, I think this is a network of democracies. Uh, and by sharing the digital public infrastructures, we are able to build uh, the digital equivalent of public parks and public libraries, uh, if you're talking about open data, right, uh, in a way that benefits uh, all the jurisdictions without arbitrarily uh, making a multilateral like this country is in other countries out um, decision. Uh, the, in Japan, I'm perhaps more famous uh, for contributing on GitHub uh, translation, uh, along with GovZero people, to the Tokyo Metropolitan Dashboard on counter COVID, uh, but I did not 
uh, go through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I did not go to go through the uh, Taipei representative office or whatever. Uh, we simply made a pull request because the components are open source. They are, they're free software. They're freely available online. So um, the more we contribute to these commons, uh, just like the Wikipedia editors, right? You wouldn't say that we ban the use of those uh, Creative Commons data in certain jurisdictions simply because they are not recognized by the UN as a country or something like that. We would simply say uh, that this is a commons and the more that the democracies want to engage the commons, the more they learn from the OpenStreetMap community, the Wikipedia community, and many other communities. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I will uh, I will give the floor for the last questions to the people who have not taken the floor. So I'm sorry, Abdulaziz, uh, you may have to pass on this one. Uh, so we had um, Amna, you had a question. I saw your your hand raised at some point. Oh, isn't it? Maybe I missed. And then otherwise, Fatma has two questions. Uh, one is regarding uh, I don't know if you can see it in the in the chat, Minister Tang about, um, I guess it's pretty related to the uh, to the question we had before about the threat mm -hmm. of uh, foreign interferences and, mm -hmm. and also the threat of surveillance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, um, I think the, the idea uh, is to make sure that the surveillance is done in a way that is civic meaning that uh, the surveillance is voluntary, uh, is well understood by the population. At the end of the day, uh, through privacy enhancing technologies, it's not aggregated anywhere outside of its purpose. Uh, and pre previous uh, to the pandemic, there simply was not a lot of incentive to invent the technologies like this. Uh, but because of the pandemic, uh, the contact tracing example that I show you, um, it, it means uh, you know, between um, people not trusting the government anymore and suffering from lockdown or fatigue. Uh, and uh, the Taiwan model, which is uh, 23 million people and less than 1,000 people dead. Uh, and, and so um, it makes the world of difference whether we invent a good norm-based privacy enhancing technology such as the 1922 SMS uh, contact tracing system. And uh, the inventors, because they're Gov0, uh, they're straight in the social sector, they established the norm around which those data is used. So when it's trying to be repurposed uh, by the police or whatever, uh, the, the society, right, the social sector has the final say. Uh, so I think this is important in any jurisdiction to trust your citizens to come up with social innovations such as this one, instead of saying that you have to go to a digital nightclub uh, in order to have any opinions, simply find out what kind of uh, public parks uh, and campuses that uh, your local people have already built and chance are they are actually fully private enhancing so that's the uh, the answer I have to the first question the second question um, is an interesting one right because uh, I think a digital democracy actually makes us less vulnerable uh, the, in democracy, you have already entertained uh, all those different people's different ideas. Um, you become inoculated against uh, propaganda of any kind because after uh, participating uh, in a um, multi-sided deliberation, one has the capacity in one's mind uh, to take all the sides, as I mentioned. And because of that, uh, you are not going to blindly share whenever something uh, that just seems outrageous uh, simply cause uh, you to to, uh, press the share button or the reply button, uh, so to speak. Right. So uh, for all the propaganda and disinformation uh, tactics, uh, I do believe uh, that only when people are actively fact checking uh, day to day, actively proposing uh, new policies day to day, instead of just a uh, you know machine learning, uh, make it collaborative learning. Once people are in a collaboratively learning culture, I do believe that this is the strongest uh, resilience and resistance against uh, digital authoritarianism. So I hope that answered the question. Um, I think the moderator froze in time. OK, um, well, in that case, um, I would just read from the chat. Uh, 
what do you think are the chronic flaws uh, do you think are in the system that I intend uh, to work with? That's also a very good question. Um, I think um, it relies on two things. One, it relies on broadband as a human right. If you do not have broadband as a human right, it will incur additional economic cost to people who are less served uh, by the internet, and it will uh, result in uh, making the inequity even worse uh, by including people with broadband by excluding people without. Right. So in Taiwan, even on the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters, you are guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second uh, by directionally for just 15 euros per month. Otherwise, it's my fault, personally my fault. Uh, so I do have people emailing me saying. Uh, that they don't have broadband connection in one of the quarantine hotels near the Yangming Mountain. And we make sure that we set up a repeater to improve that in just two weeks. And well, they're already out of quarantine, but he actually drove back to measure the speed and uh, post on social media to hold me to account. So fanatical commitment to uh, broadband as a human right, that's the first thing. And the second thing is in basic education, we need to make sure that instead of just literacy, which is for consuming uh, the information, we need to teach competence. So that the students feel uh, fully empowered uh, to, as I mentioned, measure their own weather quality, measure uh, their uh, own uh, assessment on the effectfulness of the presidential candidates, uh, alongside many other things. If we uh, do not emphasize that in basic education, uh, then we risk uh, creating, like capturing uh, propagandist uh, narratives uh, that will leave people worse off. Right. So uh, I do think that independent, critical, and creative thinking uh, competence, not just literacy in basic education is the other often missed uh, pillar uh, in addition to problem as human rights. Hope to answer your question. Um, so if there's no other questions, uh, I, I think I'll just read some poetry and wait for the power to uh, come back. Uh, this is my job description, uh, a poem that I wrote when I was in New Zealand uh, in 2016 when I uh, became the digital minister. And uh, the backstory was that uh, uh, the people were, were asking me, uh, so, so we never had a digital minister, what would a digital minister do? And I was like, well, um, IT just connects machines, uh, digital connects people. And uh, people were like, this is pretty arbitrary. Uh, can you actually tell the differences between IT and digital? And I said, okay, I'll try. So uh, what follows is my job description it goes like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So that's my job description. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. Okay, um, I, I do have to run, uh, so <laughs> I, I can't really answer uh, more questions, uh, I'll just leave you uh, with the thought um, to let's just trust our fellow citizens. Uh, thank you very much. Live long and prosper. A few moments later. Minister Tang, can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, I, I was just packing up, uh, but but that's fine. I, I think we concluded peacefully. Well, we, we, we will conclude. So very sorry, total blackout in the building. So, you know, and mm -hmm. the, we can finish on this note, if, uh, if, if you uh -huh. agree. Uh, well, digital technologies are still fragile somehow. <laughs> Bro broadband is a human right and resilience must be planned. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree. I completely agree. And anyway, we, we took uh, too much of your time already. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would like to conclude this way. I thank you so much for your time, mm -hmm. for your talks. Um, it's, it's a great lesson for us, for all of us. Uh, I, I'm a political scientist. I'm not techno savvy, uh, but now I understand that I have to do my homework in certain new technologies. And uh, it was a pleasure. And it's always, um, you know, enlightening to, to hear from you. So again, thank you so much. And um, I wish you all the best, Minister Tang, in your activities and in the near future. Thank you, uh, and uh, I trust that you have the recordings, uh, so share it yes. uh, with, with our people, and I'll also disseminate it uh, into the commons. So thank you for contribution to we the Creative do. Commons. Okay, cheers. Yes, we Bye. Do. Thank you so much. Live thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.